Greetings. Welcome to In Conversation with Trevor, brought to you by Heart and Soul Broadcasting Services. I go beyond the headlines and beyond the sensational. Today, I'm in conversation with Professor Arthur Guseni Oliver Mtambara, the former Zimbabwe Deputy Prime Minister, world-renowned roboticist, chartered engineer, and an academic. If you enjoy this conversation, remember to subscribe, to like, and share. Let's get down to some work. Professor Arthur Guseni Oliver Mutambara, I am excited to have you. Welcome. Thank you very much for this opportunity to share with your viewers. Fantastic. We want to tap into your wisdom today. So before we go there, Guseni Oliver, I, I, I'm always fascinated by the middle names. What's the significance of those two you see, names? Guseni is Someone is happy to have a son. So my father had three daughters before I was born. So he said, But he was not being very creative because his father did the same. <laughs> um, when he got Benjamin Mutambara, who was called Guseni as well. So right. I have a son. Mm. Mm. And Oliver? My uncle, uh, brother to my mother. Mm was called Oliver Ndora. Fantastic. So Oliver Ndora is from... I mean, we're sitting here, Prof, and we are surrounded by your books. And you have done quite a lot. You've been, like I said, the former Zimbabwe Prime Minister. Deputy Prime Minister. Deputy Prime Minister, I'm sorry. Deputy Prime Minister. Do you sometimes stop and, like, pinch yourself? Is this me? Do you, when you look back, is this what you thought would happen with your life? Um, not exactly the way it, it turned out, but I've always been ambitious. Uh, I grew up in a very competitive family. When you came back from school and you're number two, no one was interested in your <laughs> report card. You know, three sisters older than me coming back as number one, number one. So when I went to school, number one was the default position. And so... At some point, I was very caught up on academic excellence. Mm -hmm. But uh, then I realized, no, I need more than academic excellence. I must care about society, social responsibility, understanding society. So I've always been, you know, very keen to make a difference in society. Mm -hmm. So I'm not surprised. You're not surprised. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But I couldn't have predicted yeah. the way things turned out. But um, I was ambitious from a very early age, mm -hmm. from high school. We will get to... To, to that part of your life. You have um, brought us books that you have written. Uh, one that I'm particularly interested in is Ideas uh, and Solutions. Uh, when you're deputy, deputy Prime Minister and beyond in search of uh, the elusive Zimbabwean dream. Um, on the, on the uh, table there are um, uh, other three books. This, is, this has been an anthology. Volume one was The Formative Years and the Big Wide World. Volume two was The Path to Power. I was fascinated by that title, The Path to Power. Was your path to power deliberate, calculated? Uh, yes and no. Um, yes, in the sense that I've always wanted to make a difference. And in fact, uh, path to power is kind of pejorative. It's the path to influence, path to making a difference. But you know, when you write books, you want to give a catchy title to your book. So Path to Power... Uh, actually, it's not even very creative. Thatcher has a book similar to that. We are emphasizing the journey, mm. the path to influence. All right. Um, so in a way, because I've always wanted to make a difference, I wasn't surprised. Um, but the way I got to power, uh, you know, what surprised me, mm. you know, to become deputy prime minister. I what surprised I have, you? Because it was very incidental. What, surpri what surprised you about getting it, into it, power? It was very circumstantial, you know, the split in the MDC, then the colleagues, you know, uh, reached out to me, then I got involved. It was a hung parliament, negotiations, deputy prime minister. Mm. I mean, I couldn't have scripted that. Mm. I couldn't have planned that. Oh, so, but, but however, I'm not surprised by the opportunity to lead because I've always wanted to make a difference. Mm. Mm. 
In in that um, split within MDC, you being called, who made the call first? Was it Welshmen or you made the call? Uh, no, uh, the colleagues approached me. Okay. Yeah. And details are in the book, so, yeah. but uh, the colleagues approached yeah. me. Yeah, but yeah. people haven't read the book, so uh, this is an opportunity yeah. for yeah. you to yeah. share. Yeah. The um, colleagues approached me, yeah. and then I reviewed the situation, and um, I took a plunge and uh, made mistakes and also got some things right. Mm. Mm. When you look at, I mean, we are in an election year now, 2023. I mean, it's, I think it's almost four weeks before or is it five weeks or so before before the election? You were in the GNU. You were influential. You had walked the path to power. When you look now where we are with an election so close to us, what concerns you about the terrain, the players, the circumstances yeah. that we found ourselves in? The major issue that concerns me is the same old story. <laughs> Unfree and unfair elections. The voters' role is not available. The opposition is having a hard time holding their rallies. Opposition leaders are in prison. Gary Vume and Scala are locked up. Uh, the media, the traditional media, the state uh, TV and state papers are not covering the opposition. So the traditional story of the unfree and unfair elections worries me because we're going again into this issue of legitimacy, credibility for elections. And this has been going on since 2000. So 23 years. We haven't found a way in this country to carry out free, fair, and credible elections. That's my concern. That's your concern. And the second concern is that I'm not very clear about the vision. What are you going to do when you get in? What's your economic vision for Zimbabwe? Who, for who? What's your, For everybody. Okay. What's your strategy to achieving that vision? Mm. Where is your implementation matrix? Who's going to do what? When are they doing it? What are the milestones to measure success and lack of it? The detailed implementation planning across the board. Those are my concerns. Mm. But I must give credit to those who are in the arena First, always, isn't it? Yes. It's easier for you and ah, I to sit and that's, criticize. That's why I always uh, give credit yeah. and respect the players. Mm -hmm. So you you say you you say a very important thing: the same old story. Yes, um, an election that's likely to be disputed because the voters' role is not in place. The opposition is not being allowed to campaign. The public media is not covering. Uh, the uh, the opposition, we've got people in prison. M my question to you there would be, so why are we doing it? We have to do it and we can't give up until we get it right. Uh, why? Because we owe it to our people to test the system, to fix the system, and one way of fixing the system is participation. You know, participation in the processes in the activities of democracy is important and eventually we'll get it right. Mm. So we participate even when we know, as we sit here, if I've heard you before, right before that the outcome is almost yeah. known. It, 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 we, we have to do that. And eventually something will give. Eventually we'll get it right. Mm. And also we can't give up. It's not an option giving up on ourselves. Mm. And no one is coming to save us. We are the change that we want to see in the country. We are the ones we've been waiting for. So there's no way we, we, we've got to continue. And that's why we support those who are in the arena. In particular, the bona fide opposition. I must make that very clear. Mm -hmm. The bona fide opposition in this country is Triple C and Nelson Chamisa. Mm -hmm. They have done very well, given what Emerson Munangagwa and his party have thrown their way, taking away their party headquarters, taking away their MPs, taking away their money. Munangagwa and ZANU PF have tried to destroy the opposition. And so, to their credit, the Triple C and their leader have survived, have survived um, in spite of the challenges that have been presented to them. So, Yes, they've made mistakes. Yes, they're not perfect, 
but we must give credit where credit is due. The bona fide opposition in the country is Triple C and Nelson Chamisa. Mm. Where, where do you think the problem is for us as a society? This is, a, for, for me, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, push as much as you, as you sure. may. Where is the problem? Us, the people, the political actors, um, you, you're 100% right. We, we've got to fix this. But where does, the, where does the problem lie? Because at the end of the day, somebody said, uh, if people believe uh, get we get a leadership that they deserve, and that's correct. We deserve this leadership. That's the correct because sometimes we are too creative for our own good. We find a way to survive and not confront the problem. We get out of the country. We you know go kia kia and get around without confronting the challenges and solving the problems. So it is important that as Zimbabweans we realize that. We will never be respected as a Zimbabwean until Zimbabwe has solved its challenges. You could be a rock star in academia, a rock star in journalism, in business, but as long as our country is in a quagmire, our country has fraudulent elections, our country's economy is dysfunctional, you will never be respected. We must take it personally what I call a vested interest approach to Zimbabwe. Mm. Irrespective of your station in life, we can't all be politicians, but in our different ways, we might find ways to solve and uh, contribute to the salvation of our country. So the challenge is that Zimbabweans sometimes find ways to get around and survive without confronting and solving their challenges. Mm. We have to confront our challenges. We have to solve them because none of us will be respected unless and until Zimbabwe is a peaceful, democratic, and prosperous nation. Mm. They, so they, they, there are some people who are saying there is likely to be a GNU after this election. Uh, they are people of faith, the church, that have, that have said, let's have a sabbatical to allow us to fix the country, the problems that you have just highlighted right now. Where do you stand as far as those two? Uh, there's been talk of a transitional arrangement uh, mechanism. Uh, where do you uh, uh, fall as far as those are concerned, particularly the possibility, this, the talk that there might be a GNU? Mm. The starting point for me, the bottom line, the non-reducible minimum is having a free and fair election. Once we do that, the winner in their wisdom can then reach out to the losers and say, in the interest of a Team Zimbabwe approach, mm -hmm. come, let us work together in an arrangement that is national, but on the basis and the foundation of a free and fair election. Mm -hmm. If Nelson Chamisa and Triple C win, the same prescription for me is to reach out on the other side and set up a Team Zimbabwe approach. If Emerson Munangagwa and Zanupiep do win, I would urge them to do the same. A Team Zimbabwe approach, a team of rivals, but on a foundation of a credible, free, and fair election. Sabbatical, no, we can't do that. It's unconstitutional. We have a constitution that says every five years we go to elections. We must do that. Unless and until we change the constitution, to provide for a sabbatical. Mm. A sabbatical is unconstitutional and not practical anyway. The protagonists will not allow that. <laughs> yeah. So I, I'm not a daydreamer. Yeah. I'm a practical, you know, Zimbabwean. Mm. The most important thing we can do for this country is enabling the holding of free, fair, and credible elections. Mm. And once that is done, we then say, in the national interest, mm. why don't you work together? Yeah and put a team Zimbabwe. What Robert Mugabe did, actually, mm. of course, he, he was a Machiavellian player. He had other visions. But in 1980, he was much smarter than, you know, Emerson Munangago. Munangago, for example, I understand very clearly why, you know, people like you were, you know, supported the coup. And you are not wrong. The idea was that if Emerson Munangago was clever, if he had 10% of, of Mugabe's intelligence, he'd have used that moment of the coup to, to, to do a Team Zimbabwe approach. Not so much for Zimbabwe, for himself. 
but he was blind, deaf, and dumb and missed the moment. Because Mugabe won 57, 57 out of eight. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He could have gone along yeah. with Don Gomo, with Don Smith, and set up his own government, but he realized that it was a Zimbabwean moment. Mm -hmm. There was so much goodwill in the world. So what do I do? I reach out to Zapu and Gomo, I reach out to Smith, and I put together a team Zimbabwe. Mm -hmm. For purely selfish reasons, because after three years, he was doing Gukura Wundi and Chasing Smith. But strategically or tactically, in the first two years, he was able to put that together. Munaka could have done the same just for two years. Why did you think he didn't? Because he's not clever. Okay. And don't tell me uh, the soldiers would not have allowed it. A clever leader will tell the cool plotters, you guys, you've carried a coup d'etat. You want me to be your civilian leader? These are my conditions. Because if you don't want these conditions, Go and be a because pro, because mm. Prof, allow me to jump sure, in. Sure, there. sure, sure, sure. It, it, it was until Chinamasa stood up <laughs> and said, "If you think this is uh, for you, meaning all of us who were, you know, uh, supporting uh, the coup, all those thousands that are in there, mm. you're fooling yourself. This now, is a Zanu PF thing." And a clever guy would have said, "Shut up, Chinamasa. I have a plan. I'm the leader. You are an ignoramus. Shut up." That's what a clever leader, a strong leader of that. Do you think when Mugabe put General Wars in charge of the army, these other guys were, okay? when he put in you know, Dennis Snowman and Anderson into cabinet, do you think there were no Zanu guys wanted to do those positions? When he brought in Gomo to be Minister of Home Affairs, a leader tells his supporters, I'm the leader, mm -hmm. I have the vision. You, you, you're right. So, so I'm saying, yeah. I, you know, a clever Mnanga mm. who is strategic mm. would have told Chinamasa to shut up. And by the way, when I proposed this, it was not so much for Zimbabwe, for Mnanga's own legacy. Yeah. I, was, sorry, I, was, I wanted to budge you sure, sure. to essentially to support your point. If you recall um, Nelson Mandela mm -hmm. after the assassination of Chris Hani uh, at FNB Stadium. Nelson Mandela stood because you remember people were angry that let's go and find yes. out whoever killed uh, uh, Chris Hani. Nelson Mandela stood up and people booed him. And he said, if you continue booing me, I'm going to sit down. Then it means I'm not your leader. But if I'm your leader, you'll, sit, you'll keep quiet and listen to me. The stadium went quiet. That's leadership. And then he stood up and said, we will not revenge. Leadership is about making unpopular decisions popular. Yeah. Leadership is not about following the wind. You can see 97% of the people going this way. A leader says, no, you are all wrong. It's this way. Challenging. Risking being unpopular. Yes, that's leadership. And they'll thank you later. Right now, I'm sure they thank Mandela for that position. Of course. Prof, I'm going to hold you there. Um, we we'll take a break. Uh, when you come back, when we come back, please don't go away. When we come back, we're going to get into uh, this book that uh, Professor Mutambara has written and uh, get into the GNU. Does he have any regrets? Uh, what would he do differently if uh, GNU was to be, to be done again? So don't go away. See you on the other side. ZANU-PF created the challenges we're experiencing in our country and ZANU-PF cannot solve it. Welcome back to our conversation with Professor Atha Mutambara, former Zimbabwe Deputy Prime Minister, world-renowned roboticist, chartered engineer, and an academic. So you, you've been generous with Nelson Chamisa, which is fair enough. You've been harsh with uh, uh, Emerson Nangagu, and I think you're right. I agree with you. What's your assessment of the other players? For instance, uh, um, Tyson Kasuku, what's your assessment? And Omwan Zora, what's your assessment of those other players? We must always be respectful of the man or woman in the arena. When someone steps up to the plate and say, I want to make a difference, I want to participate, that's highly honorable. 
we must always respect that. So I have tons and tons of respect for Muzembi and Kasukwere. They have said, we want to be players. We want to make a difference. That's honorable. Um, however, we must also be very careful not to get caught up in Zanupia factions. What Kasukwere is doing is a continuation of the Zanupia factions before the coup. Of course, he's got a right to do that. But it's not the opposition in Zimbabwe. Mm. It's not the bona fide opposition to Zimbabwe. It's not the solution to Zimbabwe. ZANU-PF created the challenges we're experiencing in our country, and ZANU-PF cannot solve it. Mm. Kasukwere and Mzembi have been part of ZANU-PF for 37 years, and they're only you know, fighting because they lost out in their factional fights. Mm. They can't be the answer for this country. Mm. There are people in this country, in Triple C, who have been active from 1999 in the opposition, 23, 24 years. There are people who have been active for 35 years, some of us from the student movement in 1988 to now. There is a bona fide opposition in the country with a track record of opposing Zanubia. And We must show them some respect while we accommodate. And by the way, Zanupia must not stop Kasukwere from participating. We cannot use a law to stop a Zimbabwean from being a candidate. That must be opposed. But at the same time, we must know the history of all the players. Aren't we falling into the trap um, of which has been created by ZANU-PF? If you didn't go to the war, you have no right to rule this country. Because you're saying there's a bona fide opposition. I, I started uh, activism when I was 13 years old yeah. in ZAPU. <laughs> sure. um, are, are we not falling into the trap of saying, these, this is the opposition. What about if somebody else comes up? Um, should, should we not just say, let the people decide who's going to, who's, who's going, who's going to run and who's going to be elected? I, I'm afraid that we're now creating a, a situation where there's, some people are supposed to own the IP to being in opposition. Mm -hmm. Do you want to push back? I, I, I understand where you're coming from very clearly. We don't want a culture of entitlement in our politics. But I'm making a different point. I'm talking about people coming from ZANU-PF becoming our saviors. People coming from ZANU-PF talking about Gugra Hundi. ZANU-PF implemented Gugra Hundi. So a ZANU-PF activist who executed Gugra Hundi has no moral authority to prescribe solutions on Gugra Hundi. Joe Block, Joe X, who comes from Norway, can do anything, even with zero history of activism. I'm not saying show me your record for you to be an activist, mm -hmm. but I'm saying your baggage, your history must be taken into account when you step up to the plate to be a player. Otherwise, we end up with uh, missed opportunities where we get caught up in internal fights that belong to ZANU-PF, where people have no agendas to actually solve national issues. But we, we, we're not saying that uh, the longer you've been in the struggle, uh, the more bona fide you are. No, we're simply saying it is important that your history right, and your you. back is taken into account. Okay. And things that are sensitive, like Gukula Hundi, for example, I would want to hear from Matibelelen. Mm. What do they want? Maybe they want to know the truth first. They want to know the perpetrators. Maybe they, they want two billion, not one billion. Mm. Victim best <laughs> yeah, justice. Yeah, yeah. Victim best restoration of communities. In other words, we should not be opportunistic about serious matters in our country. Mm. I'm, I'm very sensitive about okay. that. I hear you. I hear you. And uh, I hear you. Absolutely. The, the, let's go to the coup now. You, you know I've lifted my hands in a number of times and said, I'm, I'm not apologizing for having supported sure. Nangago because mm. I believe at that particular time that you could have changed. Do you, do, were you yourself maybe also hoodwinked? Because I was reading your book mm -hmm. and you say um, in the preface, you say, the removal of Zimbabwe's strongman, long serving President Robert Mugabe by a people backed coup d'etat in November 2017 was greeted with euphoria, excitement, and high expectations. What was your initial assessment? Of my assessment was that there was an opportunity for change. There was so much goodwill in the country in Zimbabwe, so much goodwill in Sadak, so much goodwill in the continent and globally. 
after the departure of Mugabe, which goodwill was squandered by lack of intelligence, by lack of strategic thinking. A different leader in 2017 could have created an opportunity of delinking with the past. Mm. So I am very clear that there was an opportunity because it was a Zimbabwean moment, not a ZANU-PF moment. Not an individual moment. Not at all. But however, there was lack of leadership yeah. on the part of those who were propelled into power by the coup d'etat. In particular, me. as we've discussed earlier on, yeah. Emerson Mnangagwa. Tell, tell, me. tell me, having been close to Emerson Mnangagwa as Deputy Prime Minister, um, having seen the man, are you surprised that things have turned the way they did? Particularly given the fact that you're saying there was an opportunity which was missed. And some of us thought he will realize that there's an opportunity, but he didn't. Are you surprised that he didn't see the opportunity? With hindsight, I'm not surprised because um, the ability is very minimal there. The competence is very minimal there. He's not a very able man. Uh, in, in fact, in many fronts, there's one, the failure to take advantage of the opportunity presented as the coup, and the issue of ethnicity and tribalism. You know, people don't like using it, tribalism. We went through the Zulu tribalism in this country for 37 years, where Juru and Mugabe were running this as uh, a Zulu uh, hegemony. We'd expect someone coming in to do something different. We also went through Gukura Hunde anyway, forget that. So you would expect a leader who learns from history to say, this is a no-no. We don't do that. What do you get from this guy? He's worse than Mugabe in terms of tribalism. It's actual clansmanship, family, eh? Karanga hegemony in this country. Given all we know about the history of the liberation struggle, Chitepo's death, Kukurahundi, and Mugabe's Zizu hegemony, you'd expect a leader who's able to learn to say, we don't do this. Let's build a nation. So I'm very disappointed by the lack of capacity to learn from history, the lack of strategic thinking, the economy. Look at the economy, you know, as the state of our infrastructure, the state of our politics. I would expect someone to say, look, why don't I leave Zimbabwe? And, and you expected that you would do that, isn't it? I, I thought, you know, if I was coming after Mugabe, I'll be, I want to leave a legacy of the rule of law. I want to leave a legacy of constitutionalism. I want to leave a legacy of a prosperous nation. Because, I mean, liberation was done by Mugabe and Gomu, done. So, so my legacy would be yeah. around the law, mm -hmm. around the economy, around a nation as opposed to ethnicity. Mm -hmm. But again, it's not happening. And I put it to a lack of vision mm -hmm. and an understanding of the importance of legacy. What would I be known for when I'm gone? Mm. Mm. But there's, there's not been capacity to do that. Yes. You um, say uh, about... Uh, and also insecurity. You know, yeah. when I look at him in Nangagwa, he has no, he has no confidence because he has done nothing. Mugabe could say I had five degrees. I brought independence. Um, I'm the founding father of this nation together with Ngomo. And I gave you land. That gives you confidence. This guy has zero. And that's why he's so insecure and so authoritarian and using uh, you know, strong arm tactics, tactics because of insecurity mm. by virtue of having no contribution. Mm. But this is why I thought you could then work on exactly. contributions. Exactly. My point exactly. Mm. So my point, mm. Prof, um, when he came in, that's exactly where you are. This man must realize what Robert Ngabe did wrong. This man must want to leave a legacy. Yes. Particularly Gugurawundi. He was involved. Mm -hmm. You know, he was yes. not he was not a he was mm -hmm. not standing by. Mm -hmm. Nangago was involved in mm -hmm. Gugurawundi. So a key, a, a key a key proponent, player. key player. Exactly. Yeah. So he's now in charge. Why don't you come first day you apologize? Make right rest, restitution by the victims and the survivors mm -hmm. and that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. But he misses the opportunity. Anyway, in the book, you say, <laughs> you made me laugh. You're trying to see uh, uh, President Mugabe 
You've made an appointment. Uh-huh. You've been told you can come and see the man. And you're being stopped downstairs. Uh-huh. And you're like, what, 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 why am I being stopped downstairs? Uh-huh. You, say, <laughs> you then say to Mugabe when you got in uh, that you're being stopped. And he say, Robert Mugabe said, oh, those two are just overzealous and insecure handlers. They fear your growing influence and impact. And those two were Chiwengwa and Nangagwa. Uh-huh. Talk to me about that. You see, 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 these uh, plotters have uh, been plotting for a long time. Every time you get close to Mugabe, they were worried about that because they were thinking succession. So although I was an outsider, just the fact that Mugabe had respect for me, had time for me, worried these people. To the extent that Mnangagwa tried to stop a meeting, an official meeting that Mugabe had called, by asking security people to stop, and I had to use, you know, brute force to to just push the security guy. I could have been shot, and, and got in. And um, Gabi laughed about. It. He said, "Look, these are psychophants. Uh, they are worried about you getting close to me because they think influence comes from closeness, and so and, and so you find that the, the 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 they were manipulating the old man by access, limiting access from people." So Mugabe was very contemptuous of these people. And, uh, but of course, I think he overstayed his welcome and then they outplayed him. Mm. But uh, he, he was never impressed by them. And Do you think, mm. Robert Mugabe, in your closeness, you, you talk about your conversations with him and in a way you're actually saying this is Robert Mugabe uh, speaking from the grave. Uh-huh. You say in the book that he had contempt for Joyce Mujiru. Without a doubt. You know, you know, Mugabe was a serious Machiavellian player. Mujiru, Joyce was just a place filler. Mugabe never, never uh, thought of Mujiru as a successor. But of course, she thought she could be a shoe in. But um, there was complete contempt. He was managing General Mujiru. So General Mujiru was a player. But he was a clever player because he didn't want a position. He wanted to be a kingmaker. So how do you pacify this man? You know, put the wife there. But he, he had no intention whatsoever to uh, make this woman uh, president. Did you ever and, get... So go ahead. I got the sense because of the conversations. Yeah. He was full of contempt. For example, when I laid into uh, Mme Jury in one meeting in the cabinet, he laughed and said, oh, you, he, didn't, he didn't defend it. You know, because... He, he, Read the book. Yes. But, uh, uh, <laughs> well, was, uh, please, for the viewers out there, I've read the book. There's uh-huh. lots of explosive stuff. But, but let stuff me explain here. that. Yeah. She was so naive in uh, Korea Simpleton in my book. After Mujuru was taken out, after the general was killed, the game was up for, for Joyce. She didn't see it. How do you have your husband eliminated by some people? And then those and people. And you are the vice president. And then, then they make you president. It's impossible. Once your husband is taken out by these guys, there's no way in hell they would make you president. Because what if you seek revenge? What if your children say, our father was taken out, now we are president? So the game was up for Joyce in 2011. And why with the you, death of I, General Mujuru. Still at the top of my mind, uh, Prof, is the question, why did she not seek justice for the husband? Why she, did she not say the matter must be She was day? naive. She was thinking, I can still get there. Let me rock, rock the boat. Don't rock the boat. I may still become president. So I think justice for my husband is secondary. Wow. Let me wait for the prize. Wow. Naivety of the highest order. Wow. Values, principles. Aha, zero. Values, principles. Zero. Talk to me. Did you ever see an indication, an inclination? That, Nangagwa, uh, rather, that Robert Mugabe would have wanted Nangagwa to be his successor? No. In fact, you know, this tactical error that Mugabe made was that to get rid of Maimujuru, he had to align with Nangagwa. Because Maimujuru had been vice for 10 years, she was controlling the party. And people were identifying with her, assuming mm. that she's the successor. <laughs> so Maimujuru G40 was the party. So Mugabe could not have taken out G40 without Mnangagwa. So it was a marriage of convenience between Mugabe and Mnangagwa to take out G40. And then the next move was then to take out Mnangagwa. And that failed. Mm. And also he overplayed his hand. He was 90, Absolutely. you know, and he was no longer as smart and tactical as Would he was, you, you know? say mm. as a leader that at that particular time, he should have been a bit meticulous about succession planning? 
My view is very simple. Robert Mugabe should have left office around 2000, maybe even earlier. And then usher in a successor of his own choice, supervise the transition, control the succession, and secure his legacy. The Nyerere way. He could have had two, three presidents before he died. But because Mugabe was never um, about legacy, and I talk about it in the book, Mugabe was a very small man intellectually. He was about the here and now. You know, you know, caught up in gossip. Yes, you, you know, you you see, know, he was not the like a man. Like, there's no I, vision. I must jump in there. <laughs> the, the contrast, Prof, cannot yeah. escape you. You have Nangagwa, incompetent, mm -hmm. out of depth completely. Doesn't think nation, thinks tribal, he thinks mm -hmm. family. That's Nangagwa. You sure. You have Robert Mugabe. He gets the big picture, but he lacks the passion to build for the country. He doesn't get for his legacy. Yeah. He doesn't get the picture. He gets isn't part, that, isn't he that get, a thesis in leadership? No, he gets a bit of the picture. Um, you know, nationalism, a bit of Pan-Africanism. Yeah. But he doesn't understand the importance of legacy. That I'm going to die, mm. I must be known for something. I must leave a nation that will celebrate me. Mm. I must ensure that there are other people who can run this country. I mean, I give two quotes in the book. When Robert was young, I think standard six, he went on stage. He was asked, what do you want to do when you grow up? And I quote, when I grow up, I want to be a teacher if I can. Close quote. Very humble. Very humble. Then I fast forward the year 2004. He's drunk on power. And I quote, I don't know anyone who could have run this country better than me. Close quote. How do you move from that humility to megalomania? Mm. He should have realized that I'm a human being. Mm. I'm going to die and go. Mm. But I must secure my legacy by ensuring succession on my terms. Supervise the succession, secure my legacy, and then check out after I have seen this. And also after I've written. Mm. Can you imagine Robert Mugabe from Fort Year 1951 to Ghana to 1960 when he joins the NDP to 1980 to 2017. That is a lot of history. He was in the front seat of Zimbabwean history, front seat of African history, not even a pamphlet, mm. a travesty of justice. So legacy is about documentation. Mm. So he should have stepped down and also written his account of Fort Hare, his account of Ghana, his account of the 10 years in jail, his account of the liberation struggle in Mozambique, and his account of 37 years of running this country. That is legacy. He did not understand that. Mm -hmm. Prof, we'll take a break. Uh, please don't go away. When we get back, um, um, we're going to go into Gukura Wundi. We're going to go into your um, relationship with Professor Welshman, that you do share uh, a bit here. So please don't go away. See you on the other side. We were very keen on delivering on the economy and the constitution. Uh, that we didn't think about the post-GNU. Welcome back to our conversation with uh, Professor Arthur Mutambara, uh, mm -hmm. former Deputy Prime Minister of Zimbabwe, world-renowned roboticist, chartered engineer, and an academic. So, Prof, you find yourself in the GNU, Government of, Nation, of National Unity. Talk to me about, when you look back now, do you have any regrets? Are they missed opportunities? What's, yeah. your, what's your sense? Uh, like? Some serious regrets. <laughs> a key part of the agenda of the GNU was carrying out political reforms, electoral reforms. Zero. 
out of a hundred. We failed to deliver political reforms. We failed to deliver electoral reform. That's why the terrain is still what problematic today mm. because of our failure. Why? I'll, I'll come, but I want to yeah. give another okay. another sure. failure, another sure. failure. We were very keen on delivering on the economy, on the constitution, uh, that we didn't think about the post-GNU. What are you going to do post-GNU? We were so naive to the extent that we spend a lot of time doing good work on the economy. Good work, constitution was another product that we did okay. But we failed to plan for the post-GNU in the sense that ZANU was waiting for us to be offloaded in 2013 and then continue on their own. So that post-GNU lack of planning was a failure. And the issue of political reforms was a failure. Successes where we delivered the constitution, 2013 constitution, that's a reasonable outcome. Our economy was fairly stable, dollarized. Um, our economy under the GNU was successful. So successes and failures. Why did we fail on political reforms? A coalition government is never the best way to run a country. It was a team of rivals. And um, there has to be agreement on many things. And ZANU PF was not interested in political reforms. And so, well, we didn't try hard enough, but also it was a difficult exercise because it was a team of rivals where agreement was required for the implementation of those political reforms, but failure nonetheless. Mm. I mean, if these, if these issues were important, Prof, why were, was there no sacrifice to ensure that political reform, political reform happens? Because political reform is, upon, is the foundation of which, yes. upon which everything is built. Did you guys get too comfortable? No, we you got caught up on uh, exactly things like uh, the economy and delivering to the people. Did you not get too comfortable? I will well, ask again. I, I think, well, personally, I wasn't comfortable. I was still, you know, agitating for change, working on national vision, national branding. But I say, I, I think being a minister of government, the deputy minister of government, being a prime minister, I think there's an element of comfort there. So I must say guilty as charged. Um, but I think it was a personal concentration. We want to run a ministry, we want to do this. Forgetting that the reason why there was a hung parliament the reason why the elections were rigged was because of the need for reforms. Mm. So you're very correct in so far as you say, we should have put more effort on the political reforms, on the electoral So We did not. That's why we put it as a failure. Okay. Um, you write here in detail about your, the drama behind the scenes. You... Uh, Priscilla Musiarambu uh, and uh, Welshman Mube, to the extent that you actually call Welshman Mube, uh, you agree with somebody who called Welshman Mube a snake in the grass. Um, have you now reconciled with Welshman? No, let me correct that. Uh, in the book, I caught Innocent Gala, yeah. who surprised me. I was working very well with Welshman, no drama, no nothing around 2009. And he says to me, in front of me, uh, that is G of yours. You must watch him. Stuck in the grass. So I, I, I did not necessarily agree with him. I just say with hindsight, I was surprised by that remark from Eno Singala. Look, politics is a very tough game. It's a very difficult game. You make mistakes. Uh, you do things right. Your colleagues make mistakes. They do things right. So it was a very tough exercise. And I did tell in the book the differences that occurred. And my major bone of contention is that my colleagues did not anticipate a hung parliament leading to a deputy prime minister. Mm. Their thinking in terms of engaging me was to survive as a political party, you know, win some seats and continue with the struggle. But uh, by coincidence, by history, there was a hung parliament, negotiations, mm. and we had an inclusive government. And the leader of the party became a deputy prime minister. So when that happened, even during the talks, there were views that, well, this guy can just walk in in two minutes and become deputy prime minister. And it's, it's a natural, you know. And so there, there were views that felt that um, even during the talks, this guy cannot be deputy prime minister. He just came in yesterday. 
I did not know that. It's now hindsight. But um, so the differences were there. The mistakes were made. And um, it was kind of ugly in places. Mm. And I, I, I am very clear in the book uh, about my side of the story. Mm. But I expect colleagues to also write and, mm. and so on. Mm. But um, this is a, an account of history. Yeah, because you say... It's I an mean, account of history. Yeah, I'm not going to let you go on this. Because yeah. you say on the innocent color thing, you yeah. come back and you say, well, uh, innocent color must have known something that I did not know. As they say, you disregard words of the old and wise at your own peril. You know, Trevor, given what I went through with my colleagues, uh, I charge myself with the lack of empathy in the sense that when the split happened between Washman on one side and Changra on the other side, I should have spent more time understanding Changra. Okay, I understood Washman very well and his team, mm -hmm. which is fine, but empathy says put yourself in the shoes of the other guy. What was Sangrai's yeah. views? What, what was his concern? So you never tried to do that? Oh, then I did it, And I should have. Well, let, another, let me, another, let me another... share mm. with the public now mm. for the first time. I tried twice to bring uh, to bring Welshman Mube and Morgan Swangirai together. together mm. Twice. Um, um, first of all, went to Swangirai's place after the first split with the permission of Welshman Mube to talk to, uh, to Morgan Sangara to say, what are the problems? Can this be reconciled? I was heartbroken to find that Morgan Sangara had fallen into the tribal trap, that the people saying Welshman Mube should not come back. And I remember I keep on telling people that when I reverse going back to Johannesburg, I said to myself, this is the man who wants to lead Zimbabwe and he thinks like this. That was the first time. Second time after this, the, the, uh, I think it was uh, the, the next election that would have happened with the disunity. At the World Economic Forum in Cape Town, with the permission of uh, Morgan Sangurai, I approached Welshman and said, Welsh, you cannot go into this thing divided. With Welshman's permission, I went to the house that uh, Morgan Sangurai was given by the government to say, can you guys sit down and talk? There was no, no capacity. I share this so that this is part of, mm, the, of sure, the history. Sure, sure. I made an effort to make sure that these guys work together. They didn't. So fast forward, you say with hindsight, you should have had empathy, isn't it? Sit down with the two comrades and say, why don't we get along? No, what I'm emphasizing is that I should have been empathetic to Morgan's reasons against Washman. Oh, I see. In other words, whatever accusations, justified and unjustified, I should have entertained them for my own growth. I did not do that. Mm. So in a way, I feel that in my differences with my colleagues, uh, I experienced some of the challenges that they had before, which if I had investigated and spent some time with Morgan, I would have been a better partner to Walshman. And by the way, I have nothing personal against Brother have, have you Have you walked past that? Well, uh, it's, it's all history now. It's like 10 years ago. Yeah. But what we do, we need to document these experiences. Mm. We can't, you know, you know, whitewash it or blackwash it, mm. whichever way you want to put it. We need to write authentic history. Mm. Mm. Uh, but we all learned, I learned, and the struggle continues. Mm. Mm. Robert Mugabe was very, you know, uh, reflective. He was very thoughtful about tenure. And his view was that uh, this land reform program is not sustainable. So if the leader of a corrupt system has 40, what about the deputy? Chiwenga and Mayam Juru, Munangagwa, the judges, the generals. Are you telling me they've won each and the top guy has got 40? We are not that naive. <music>